away and say, what is the user going to see? What's he going to care about? What's he going to experience? How do I give him that? As opposed to, I made up this really cool piece of code. I need to voice that on people, right? That's, that's, uh, that's, that happens in a lot of bad product design, bad game design too. Just like you, you'll come up with this amazing, intricate thing that you understand, and then if people don't enjoy it. It's somehow their fault for not getting it. You know, you're an expert. Of course, you understand it better. Make something they understand. Yeah. You've worked at small companies and large companies, uh, and talked a little bit about your preferences for each. You talk about working with uh, within teams and sort of both of those environments. And Maybe sort of what the differences or, or how you're working with people, uh, the communication takes place, and some of those differences. Yeah, I, I have mostly enjoyed working with smaller teams. I'm not a good team manager. I don't organize people very well. Um, so the team that I'm on right now, there are, there are other people involved in the loop, and it's basically just the three of us: the designer and the artist and the coder. And the, the structure of that relationship is we have a wiki that has all the game um, story stuff on it. it. I'm trying not to put too much game details on it, like numbers, because those are going to be constantly changing and it's hard to update the wiki. But we also have the numbers in, in Excel type spreadsheets uh, up on Google Docs. So we can look at the numbers and they can all, we can all just kind of change them in those files. Um, we communicate. Uh, Pretty much daily, we have Skype just open all the time, chat window there, so someone will put a question in and then an hour later, the next guy will sit down and oh, I see a question for me and answer it. So that thread is always going. Um, and then we have a bi-weekly Skype phone meeting where we're all just talk and make sure we're all on the same page. There's um, a couple of other people involved in the project. I'm not very good at writing schedules or really following them, so uh, one of the other designers, the other designers <coughs> is helping me write uh, the the work plan you get, you get it sort of the scoped out, right? The, the project management part is saying these are the features we need done by this time, because um, I've never really independently produced a, a computer game. Like I'm always working with a big team to do it, so I don't really know how big each one of those pieces is, or I couldn't even identify some of the pieces. Uh, so we go off that schedule when we can. That that is the team structure that I'm pretty happy with. Um, when I was publishing my own games. Uh, I was lead designer and graphic designer on all the products, so I would do the uh, the print buying and I would wrangle uh, the artists and sort of work with each individual contributor to, to pull the piece together and then work with the printers and work with the distributors to, uh, to get it shipped out again. Uh, and that, that worked fine too. Like I said, I complained about it. I was doing so much administrative work, not design work. Um, the bigger the company gets, the more um, people kind of get layered into the equation, the more people would show up at every meeting and we'd say no. And, and the more uh, uh, conservative the general atmosphere is. And I don't think you can make good entertainment by being conservative. Um, I think that Microsoft is a terrible entertainment company for that reason. Even when they try to break up into smaller groups, they still have this really heavy superstructure of management on top of their heads that are whipping them around and taking away their money and reorging them all the time and telling them that's not good and that's not going to work. And <clears throat> that's, you know, kind of, in a sense, the adult brain, but it's really just sort of the dinosaur corporation saying, we don't need to take risks. No, 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 we let small companies take risks, and then when they succeed, we buy them. It doesn't make sense for us to take that big of a risk because we're just kind of, we have all this momentum anyway, we can just do what we've been doing. So it's hard to be part of a creative studio as part of that larger organization. I was always running into and carbonated into reasons why we couldn't do X, Y, and Z or limitations that seem to be to be sort of artificial, but so, so yeah, much more frustrating to try to create uh, entertainment in a larger group. Okay. Well, uh, if we don't have any more questions, oh, I can always ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're, uh, we're about at pizza time. We're, we're almost at pizza time. Should we go until the pizza shows up? <laughs> if uh, somebody is. <clears throat> really kind of the child brain most of the time and wants to tie in with a company like yours which sets up teams. Do you help marry them up to the technical people? And the, because you work with small teams, right? You have three guys and then you just kind of... So how does that work for somebody who wants to get involved in your process? I don't know. I mean, the other thing about small companies is everyone is so different. Uh, everyone has a different relationship with everyone in it. Like, everyone, 
uh, in, a, in a three man team, everyone just is, does what they can. Mm -hmm. So if someone were to come and join this group, we would make the situation for him that was appropriate for him. I don't, you know, it would just depend. Uh, I'm surprised that I'm part of this because these guys seem to be doing pretty good, just the two of them. But uh, they, they liked my game design stuff, so they brought me on board. Yeah. Um, so you said that uh, the mo one of the most important things was to have a good theme for your game before you really start developing anything else with it, right? So if a person is good at doing narrative, um, that's probably a really, really strong skill to marry up with the, the two other technical parts of that, the designer and the coder. Yeah. I yeah, know it's, it's definitely true. Now, not all games are that complicated that they need a narrative or, or, or you know, that, or a story guy. Um, the kind of games that I like to do generally don't. And so like a casino game might have a very light theme, but mostly it's mechanics, mostly it's an, an, an analysis. Um, if it's an RPG, if it's a, if it's a first person shooter, if it's a game with a lot of story content, then yeah, that, that story writer needs to be involved. And it's unfortunate that there are some disciplines that appear so easy that everyone tries to think that they can do them. Um, game design is kind of one of those. That, and in fact, in, on the computer game side, the job of game designer is not what on the hobby side we call game designer. He's really mostly a developer. So, and unfortunately, the developer needs something else on the computer side. But at, at Wizards, there were two jobs that were very different jobs. And sometimes they were done by the same person, but they were distinct jobs. And the, the first job was designer. He starts with nothing and makes a game. The second job is developer. He starts with a game and makes something that works and adds content. So the designer is kind of the, you know, the high mountain guy who says, I have a great idea for a game. It shall be played with trading cards within trading card sleeves inside of a binder. And the way when you turn the pages, you can see through the sleeves. Isn't that amazing? And that's the designer's job. And the developer's job is really OK. I'll take the 10 cards that you've made for this game and the kind of shaky rules, and I will make another 100 cards to go in it and finish it. Um, typically, development, by that definition, is what designers are doing in computer games. Because the game that they're making is probably a version of a game they've already played. When I say Angry Birds is a version of Crush the Castle, that's just two games where you fire something and you have physics and knock it over. There's probably other ones too, I just don't know them all. Um, but as a general rule, every new game that you see, if you are experienced enough in the game industry, you can say exactly what game it is based on. It's very rare that a game just comes out of nothing. And so those game designers, their job is to make new content for those old mechanics, or to put you know, a new twist on an existing game. That's how those games evolve, and that's where they come from. Because games, computer games, are so expensive to produce, it is a conservative industry. They have to sit, be able to demonstrate early in a project that the finished project is going to be good. right? And if, if I don't have anything to show you, I can't prove that that project is going to be good. You have to take a lot of risk to give me money to build something out of nothing. But if I give you Breakout and say, I'm going to make a game that's like Breakout, but better, oh, OK, I'll, here's some money for that. And that's, that's kind of how that all works. So the computer <coughs> designer is almost always doing the developing job. He's, he's making improvements on something that's already sort of improved. How would someone break in to this field? What are, what are the avenues in? Are internships, is that, a, is that a way in? Is it you know, doing, some, doing enough of your own stuff that you, can, you get noticed? Is it working for a company? All of those are so, good. Okay. Um, certainly, you, want to, you go through a program and, and interview and get hired. Um, there's uh, uh, Scott Brody is a game designer who started as an intern at Microsoft and made a, uh, a little shooting flying game that I'm blanking on the name of it, but it was really good. Um, and they gave it away for free. But, but he did that during his internship and then came on as a full-time uh, producer to finish that game and get it out the door. And he's wound up being an independent sort of publisher and, and uh, designer now. Um, the way I got in was just weird. I mean, you, I just knew people, right? And I, I thought game design was cool, maybe I should do this. Um, typically in, uh, in the hobby game industry, if you're talking about an RPG company or a miniatures game company, because there's a lot of content for those games, because there's a lot of support materials like you know articles and strategy guides and magazine articles, um, People can get involved in that through, if it's a writing job, through writing for those publications, like volunteering to do a module for D&D, or uh, uh, 
scenario for Warhammer or something like, you kind of trickle up into the business from that. And again, as you do this, you get to know people. And you convince people that you're good at what you're doing, and maybe they'll actually give you money next time to do the same thing. Um, that's It's not quite so open in the computer game industry, because those you know, companies are generally bigger and you know, throwing more money around. So, uh, so I don't really know, but it's, uh, I think it's easier for a developer, a coder, to come into the business through that vector than a designer. I came into it because I had done so much work on the paper side that I was well enough known that I could get an interview and you know talk intelligently about games, even though I couldn't write code. But every interviewer at Microsoft that I talked to was like, really, you can't write code? How are we going to deal with that? Like, they did not know how to, they did not know. And that was five years ago, and things are changing, but they didn't really understand what the game designer's job was if it wasn't to write the code for the game. Um, so I'm sort of helping make that distinction. <coughs> yeah. um, have you heard of a, a game creation system called Jamala? Yes. Um, so with that system, it, it allows a team of interns who maybe not uh, don't, don't have any game programming ability, but they can build a narrative around that and create a, a, a solution and a, and a representation of that narrative in the game. Um, so w in your opinion, would using that environment be good for the first game contact with the gaming industry? Or yeah, someone who has no clue. I, I, I don't know because, um, I mean, I've heard of it, but I don't know enough about it. My expectation, though, is that any framework that's going to let you invent a game is going to let you invent a lot of the same game. Um, and so what you're going to be able to demonstrate when you work with a tool like that is your facility with that tool. Um, it's like any other tool, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that you can program a game. Probably not. But it might mean that you, that you can write a game. Like I said, I don't know the tool, so I don't know how versatile it is, but I would expect that any tool like that has pretty major limitations in terms of actually creating something original. It's got a set of mechanics that it expects a game to have. And everyone, you know, we could, we could go on for another hour defining what a game is. Everyone sort of thinks they know until you ask them, and then there's all these gray areas around the outside. But, but a, a, a tool like that probably has a very specific idea of what a game is. And those are the kinds of things you can make them. Yeah. Um, when you when you start with a theme and you start turning it into a game, where does um, I guess what I'm thinking is like the replay value come into it? Is it like if you have a good theme that there'll be as you turn it into a game there'll be replay value, or do you have themes that you know sound great? You do it once and you're like, oh well, I did it. Yeah. Um, and can those be turned into replay by adding the, the game mechanics that maybe change things? Well, I think that's another question that presupposes a certain definition of game. And some games actually don't get replayed, right? A lot of your larger RPG type story games, you play through them half or maybe once and not again. The best ones you probably play again, but it's kind of, it's engineered to be a one time through experience. The second time through is very different because you kind of know all the beats of the story. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum is a game like poker that, you know, it takes 90 seconds. And of course it's replayable because it has so much variation in its execution. It's not a content-driven game. A lot of computer games are content-driven, and when you digest that content, you're kind of done with it. And it's only replayable in the sense that you can make more content and then chew through that. Um, on the paper game side, replayability is much more interesting and, 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 if, and necessary because you can't deliver that much content. But even something like D&D, you don't want to play the same adventure in D&D again either. So it's always sort of churning through new content as well. Um, when I think of game, I definitely think of something that you can play again and again. And what that means is that you come up with a set of mechanics that can lead to uh, different situations from the same starting point. Uh, usually that's done with randomness but often it's just done with the way players interact. Uh, there are a few hobby games that are strictly not random. I mean, and not just hobby games, but paper games. When I say paper games, I mean not computer games. Um, computer games took interactive, so I guess they call them non-interactive games, but that's ridiculous, because they're all interactive. <laughs> you know. Chess is like this, and it's no randomness, but it has replayability because there's so much variety in the game states. And uh, so that's, 
that's what sort of describes a replayable game. How you get there is a matter of kind of you know aiming your aiming your design vector in the right direction. You know, is this is this the kind of chess where it's only fun if I randomize the setup, or can it actually be fun with the same setup over and over again? Uh, I actually am a fan of random chess, so so uh, not random in the game, but random setup. It's called uh, it's called Chess 960, and it was popularized by or it was, it was uh, popularized maybe the not word it's not popular, but it was uh, it was <laughs> champion, champion. That's the word I'm looking for by Bobby Fischer, who uh, shares with me the opinion that chess right now is dominated by people who memorize openings. So it's not about being able to play the game, it's about kind of knowing how to start and memorizing a bunch of things, which is not fun, it's work. And chess is very much, I think, for the hardcore players, more like work than like fun. So Chess 960 is a way to randomly generate all 960 sort of legitimate starting positions for the, for the white player and then the black player just mirrors that. So it's still a fair game from that perspective, but it's very different right at the beginning. All your opening moves are out the window. I would much rather play that game because to me that's what chess ought to be. Um, and you get through all that 47 stuff. Right. Well, right, you get through all you 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 cut through the the limitations that you have because you haven't memorized all the openings. Um, so there are plenty of hobby games that now do that, which have essentially uh, perfect knowledge play, but with a random start, so that it's going to be different every time not necessarily better for one player, certainly that's it's better if you don't just randomly advantage one player, but um, also so that you can still play competitively with someone who's played the game a lot and sort of just knows the ins and outs of the first couple of turns. Yeah. How do you categorize the SimCity kind of game to farm game? Well, this is why the word game is so terrible and why the the, just the definition of game is so sloppy all around the edges because I would call those toys if I had to call them something. Of course they're games because everyone calls them games. But, but they're not games in, in by, by any definition that uh, the, the kind of multiplayer games that I like to write. They're toys. They're very fun toys. And it's kind of like I'm up against the, the opponent that is the game. But certainly in the case of Farmville, Farmville's not my opponent. It's my friend. It's giving me all this stuff. I click on things and more things happen, right? Uh, the opponent is Zynga, because Zynga wants my money, and i got to figure out a way to play the game. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, when did that stop that being a game? Yeah, well, uh, when did that start being a game, right? Um, so, so is Tetris a game? Well, kind of, right? But it's also kind of a toy. Do you play it to get a high score? Yeah, maybe. But probably just play it because it's kind of fun to line up the blocks and to see how many blocks you can line up. Like, that's the same. Technically, it's getting a high score, but but it's, it's, it's different. It's more like a toy. And and so I would call those toy games, except that Richard Garfield, who's a game designer and a good friend of mine, uses toy game to describe something else, which is a game that is incredibly simple, a game you would probably never play, but that illustrates a design point that's, that's applicable to a more complicated set. Uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors is such a toy game. It's so simple, even though it is played, but it's so simple that you can explain Rock, paper, scissors, that cyclical dominance shows up in a lot of more complicated games where archers are better than cavalry, which are better than infantry, which are better than archers, not by a 100% dominance ratio, but more like 60-40, right? And so if you know you're up against cavalry, then you bring, what did I just say? The other thing, the thing that makes it <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, So that's a toy game from, you know, from that definition. I need to come up with a better game, a name for, for games like Tetris that are basically, you know, one player, Amusements. Yeah. Uh, if a student wants to market themselves to an employer, um, how can they stand out from the rest? What can they put on the Oh, website? I'm so unqualified to answer that question. I wish I could. <laughs> um, what would your best guess be? <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I show good work and a, and a grasp of what the employer wants you to do. You know, I, I don't know if that's distinguishing, but I, so few people do it. Um, the, uh, I don't know. I, like I said, I, I floated around in this business, so I've never really had to. I've, I've done interviews, but I've never really had to, you know, sweat them. Put a portfolio of work. Yeah. What have, yeah. What have you done, and, and, and how good is it? And to get that experience, um, you know, before they graduate, uh, you know, to, to get that internship <coughs> he was talking about. Any ideas? Of, I'm so useless on this. I wish I could tell you more. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's cool. Um, it's okay to say I don't know. <laughs> What are you, 
what are you doing for fun? Right? I mean, like, like uh, you don't need permission to get experience. You just need to do it. So if you want to build a game, build a game. And if you're not, if you can't fill all the roles, then find people who can. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I was writing board games when I was in high school. It was before I knew it was going to be my career. But clearly, you know, looking back, of course it is. Right? So, so your portfolio should have that stuff in it. Um, I don't exactly know what a game developer's portfolio looks like, but I know what an artist's portfolio looks like. It's stuff that he's done. And if it's not contract work, then it's then it's work he did on his own. And it's you know maybe not as polished or as as, as done, but at least it's something. There's something there that shows what you're capable of and what you're interested in. Um, and I think from that perspective, you should do things that you're interested in. Um, I have always considered myself to be my first player. I don't like doing projects that are ostensibly for someone who is not me. Um, so while I like writing games for kids and I like writing games for women and I like writing games for these, all these demographics, like what characterizes those games should be something that I also like. I'm not just going to do it because it's for someone else. Oh, it's such a terrible story. When I was working at Wizards, this happened a lot when I was working at Wizards, by the way. I was not in R&D, but R&D people and other departments would often come to my desk and say, James, I hear that you write games. I have a problem. Um, one of them was she had just moved to Wizards from a, a, a large toy company on the East Coast. You can't guess who that is. I can't believe. And she had developed this game that was for girls. And I, I, don't, I don't like that, right? I like to be gender inclusive. I don't like to say this is specifically for girls or say that this is specifically for boys, although you're, you know, there's certainly a whole bunch of games that are pretty clearly specifically for boys. Here's what this game looked like. It was pink and purple. Strike one. <laughs> it was called an income of her own. The gist of this game was that it was going to teach girls that they could make money too. Strike two. <laughs> it was a board game with a track, but it had a different track for every player. Kind of arranged like a swastika now that I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Strike two and a half. <laughs> and the board, the spaces on the board were marked, were, had, they had words on them, I mean, that were facing the player so that she could read them. Because you wouldn't want to have to read something sideways or upside down, because, you know, apparently only boys can do that. <laughs> it was so condescending. The jobs you could do were like, Maybe sitting and I don't know knitting. I don't know making sandwiches for the guys. I don't remember what they were, but it was just like it was teaching the absolute wrong thing. And she said, "What do you think of this game?" <laughs> it was a. It was also non-competitive. Like you could play it in a competitive way, but you were also oh, here's a better way to play it. Let's just all see how much we can do all together. <laughs> it was insulting in every possible way. So she said, "What did you think of this game?" And what, the only thing I could do was say, "Here's what I thought of your game. I made up a game." It's called He Can Cry Better Than You Can. <laughs> it's a game for boys about having emotions and sharing your feelings with other boys. And, you know, it kind of went a little bit farther than that, but that's my feeling about it. You wrote a game for a specific demographic that's insulting to everyone. <laughs> Don't do that. But every time someone comes to me with, like, I want to write a game for this specific demographic, I have to kind of think about that in the back of my mind. Is it because there's really a need that we need to fill here, or is it because there's some other thing going on that's wrong and we should stop right now? Since <laughs> <laughs> you're a dull brain, where's that, where's that <laughs> inside hey, of it? Hey, you know, I mean, there was nothing about this game to love. I mean, that's, that's what it was. It was, it, was a, it was a product engineered to sort of to make a political statement. And while it would probably sell to people who identified with that political statement, it was not a good game, right? Like, my job is to make a good game, so go ahead, sell this thing, but I have no further feedback for you. <laughs> See, now if it was ironic, then you'd have a nice flavor. Oh, I, was, <laughs> I wanted the ironic version of that. I wanted to be quite better than you can. I think that's a great game, right? But it has a totally different statement, which is games like this are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so please buy it. Right. Maybe that's a good place to wrap. I hear we have pizza out there. Yes, so, we do. Uh, all right, well, thank you all very much. Transition to pizza okay. uh, network. <laughs> If you want to learn what's going on uh, with me right now, you can visit cheapass.com or friend cheapass games on Facebook. That's what's going on. I'm publishing a lot of my older games for free uh, on the web. 
and uh, and spreadfox.com as well is where the, the you can find out what's going on with my point. Brian has cool. websites. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, Brian, you have those on your app. I believe the spreadfox.